everybody. Welcome to session two of the online virtual book study of my new book, Vegetables Love Flowers. So glad that you have um, decided to join with me again here this week. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to sharing the message of this book. So before we get started, um, I want to answer the question that I asked you all on the page of last week's session, session one, the bottom of the page, right above the video, there were some questions. And one of them was, is, you know, who are you and like, what are your gardening conditions? So I thought, you know, maybe I should do that. And so my name, you know my name, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am um, a commercial cut flower farmer um, I was a, I'm a gardener gone wild is what it kind of comes down to. And so I started gardening 20, let's see, hmm, 30 years ago I started dabbling in gardening and then about 22 years ago I read a book that led me to where I am today. Um, so I am just a gardener at heart like most of you, although I know some of you are also flower farmers and um, this book study it will apply to both of you so a little bit about where I garden so you can compare what I say to what you're doing at home I am in southeastern Virginia that is zone um, 7 and I'm an urban farmer so my little farm which is only three a little less than three acres actually um, is right smack dab in the middle of a city and I am totally surrounded by residents I'm the last commercial farmer in the city which proses, you know, proposes some interesting problems, but we make the best of it. But what this translates to you um, is that you can do anything that I talk about doing because I have no structures. I have no hoop houses or no greenhouses. Everything I grow is outside in a garden. I do all my seed starting in a 10 by 10 grow room in my work building, which is really just a big garage, but has heat. And so that's kind of where I'm gardening. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, what drives me, I totally love gardening, the whole process. But what I really love the most is production. I love going from seed, growing, growing, and then producing either flowers, buckets of flowers to share with people or to sell, and then vegetables, vegetables for my family, vegetables for those that help me here on the farm. Um, and then our market, um, our private market customers also benefit from that. So that's kind of where, where I'm coming from, and so I just really wanted to catch up on that. So this is session two, and it's chapter one of the book. The name of this chapter is why do vegetables love flowers, right? That's the question I get um, really, really often. And in a nutshell, it's because it's for the company that flowers keep. Flowers are the reason that pollinators and beneficial insects will come to your garden, right? <clears throat> just having the blooms on your vegetables is just not enough to attract what we need in our garden. So. That's basically the bottom line is flowers are the attraction to bring nature's workforce in. And they come in and then guess what? They share their benefits with the vegetables that are growing in your garden. So it is really, really, um, it's so simple that I think that's something that we've missed for many, many years. So I do wanna read to you just a, cha um, a chapter a paragraph um, from the book and I also want to say have y'all run your hand across the cover the name is raised I mean it's just it's really I'm so pleased with this book it's so beautiful so I'm gonna look at page 33 um, and I'm just gonna read the first paragraph here because it really sums up a lot of um, what we're gonna talk about the truth is that setting up the garden to help take care of itself is rooted in flowers. But it takes more than just that. It is more than a single step that brings this all to life. It is a combination of steps that encourage and help nature along. Many gardeners have tried to grow organically, but have faced mixed results with frustration and often will fall back on old ways. Let me be clear on this. Using pesticides, 
organic or otherwise, can harm beneficial insects and undermine the very workers that the flowers have attracted to the garden. So you're gonna hear that theme over and over and over again in this book. Um, so I just wanted to read that to kind of encapsulate that is the message. But I also want to point out, have y'all checked out the flaps on my book? What a great bookmark that is. So that is really awesome. Even though we have these great bookmarks, that works really even better. So we talked about that it's for the company that the flowers keep. Flowers are at the root of organic gardening. If you have been trying really hard to be an organic gardener, you've said, okay, I'm giving up chemicals, I'm not gonna treat for anything, um, and you've done that, but you've just not been successful because it's really a little more, a little bit more than just giving up chemicals. You have to plant flowers, you have to give the garden time, you have to, we're having a flyover of Canadian geese. Um, I do wanna say right now, since you heard that, we are outside on a drizzly day, but I didn't wanna miss, I wanted you to see this beautiful shade garden behind me. It's this, this particular plant, Lenten roses, hellebores, is the plant that got me started in gardening 30 some years ago. So um, I just wanted you to, to not miss, so that's what those flowers are, because we'll get a lot of questions about that. Um, it's a deep shade garden, by the way. So, <clears throat> So people have tried and failed, but there's just a few more little pieces to this puzzle that are really easy to follow and do that really brings nature into the garden because the flowers are the root. Without the flowers, the rest of the cycle just really cannot happen. Um, I think a lot of flower farmers experience this and that's because of the volume of flowers that we simply grow by that's the nature of what we're doing. And there are many organic flower farmers. Um, there are some that are not organic, um, but many of them are and they experience the same thing that I did, that literally when you grow flowers and stop using chemicals, you are overrun with nature, literally. So. The great thing about nature is she never stops trying. So it's like this. Um, I say in the book how, isn't it kind of interesting, for those of you that are growing vegetables, everybody, I think everybody, I'm not sure in all parts of the country, but most of us struggle with the squash bug, right? I mean, you plant squash and the squash bug is there and just in no time and wreaks havoc in, havoc in your garden. Well. You plant the desires of a pest, squash, for a squash bug, and they come without any help from you. The same thing is true when you plant the desires of the good bugs, right? So you plant flowers <clears throat> and you have a constant presence and the beneficial insects just start coming. You just literally will not be, you will just not understand how, where they all were before, and how did you live without them for so long. So who's coming to the garden? Um, I tell, I show a couple of examples in the book. Um, we, we're gonna do a deep dive on this when we get to that chapter at the end of the book. But I know that when I talk about this, people often come up to me after talks and say, oh goodness, you know, we have so many praying mantis in our garden or um, ladybugs, and those are good. Um, but first you need to know about praying mantis. They'll eat anything, including their mate <laughs> um, and other good bugs, which some other bugs do that too, or insects. And <clears throat> it is so much more. I would say that the praying mantis and the ladybug are kind of the poster child of the whole workforce that's underneath of them. And I mean, there are thousands of different beneficial insects um, available to us in the garden and we just don't really see them until we start rooting around in the garden. Um, and for me, once I started realizing that I was attracting them to the garden, then I'm like, I don't really want them to leave my garden, right? I mean, for me, it's really um, obvious. For those of you that live in a more rural um, situation where you aren't surrounded or if you have a big piece of property, um, 
my little two and a half to three acres seems kind of small when you're surrounded by houses. So my next focus, once I started realizing that all of these good guys were in my garden, eating other bad bugs, pollinating, our tomato production is over the top on this farm. Um, in the abundance and the quality of the tomatoes, um, because one piece of that pie is bumblebees pollinating them, right? So I then began to worry about, holy cow, what if these creatures leave my garden you know, I have people in my community right here around me that still have the little truck that drives up and sprays their lawn with chemicals. I see people put products down and treat for things in their yard. The risk of losing some of your beneficials is um, much higher when they have to leave your garden. Um, so I really, really um, try to provide everything that the insects really, really need on the farm, um, especially bees, my goodness. This, the level of their contamination um, is just so obvious that we really try hard to do that. So that's a really big part of one piece of the puzzle, flowers, then doing everything I can to keep these guys in my yard. And then there's certain things that we can do to to help these guys, the visitors, and there's certain things we can do to hurt them. Um, what is one of the things that I never dreamed about, even as a gardener for many years, um, was the importance of water. So simple, I mean, water's not free, but it is free in the big picture of everything else we're doing, right? You just need a couple gallons. A water vessel can be anything, upside down trash can lids, which has a great photo of that in the book. Um, providing water, to birds who are huge insect consumers, by the way, and then to have water available for the beneficial insects to be able to get to the water and drink it. Um, one day, a couple of years ago, my goodness, I came out, of course, without a camera. And in one of my bird baths here right outside my back door, there was three wasps just perched right on the edge of the bird bath and all three of them were drinking. I mean, that A said to me, it is really dry outside. There's just really no options for them. Um, and as you'll learn as we move through this book, wasps are one of the best workers on my farm and you just have to get over your fear of it. So water is super important and we do it, we already have water out. <clears throat> we actually leave water out year round, but we add more water vessels as we start planting our garden um, and birds start coming home, start mating, um, we want them to be able to have water and we want to train them that their water is here. And then a really fun thing um, is perches. I talk about in the book that one of the perches on our farm is all the stakes that hold up our netting, but there are so many other perches, fences, bamboo stakes. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these beneficial guys will just entertain you and share their joy while they're here working and patrolling your garden. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it really can be a whole lot of fun. Um, some of these things you can do to entice and keep your, keep your garden fun for these animals to come to, you know what I mean? You have to want them to not wanna leave. Then there's hurtful things that we can do. And one of, um, I mean, this even before I started my journey of figuring all this out, I remember when I um, married Steve and we lived in what was my house while this home that we live in now was totally gutted and restored by my father and my brother. He moved into my house. And then we packed up my garden in our house and moved in here 18 months after that all started. And I can remember, because we have fig trees on this farm, I can remember Steve telling me before we moved back up here about a horrible experience that he had with putting netting on a cherry tree to keep the birds from eating it. It was really very heartbreaking for him. Um, he came home and it was his, this was his grandpa's place and that's what his grandpa had done and so that's what he did. And he came home one day from work and there was a huge black snake caught up in the netting. And he can't even tell this story so don't anybody ask him about it if you happen to meet my husband. Um, he 
went to work trying to cut the snake out to no avail. It was, it was too late. Um, I'm not talking about flower support netting that has the big blocks that we use in our garden um, to support flowers. I'm talking about that small one inch netting that I see sold everywhere that I have people talk about, hear people talk about. Um, we hands down consider that a huge threat to wildlife. Um, and unless you do a super good job, you still don't keep the birds out. There are better ways to save your fruit, which we're going to dig deeper when we get to that chapter. But basically, it's your timing of harvest, um, that you don't need any netting. So that is a really hurtful thing to do. And then, of course, it's spraying. I now know for a fact and understand we have a lot of closet sprayers. People that go out into their garden and they find a pest situation and it terrifies them. It scares them to death and they think about it for a couple of days. They try to give nature like 48 hours to take care of the problem and then they're off to the big store to find what they can treat their problem with so they think it's a problem. Sometimes it may not even be a problem um, because we don't always get it identified. Then when they get to the place that they're going to buy spray from, they don't really know what their problem is and they start reading labels and then they decide to get a general spray which is the worst thing to do because a broad spectrum spray kills everything, everything it touches that's alive. And so I'm saying this because I do realize that there are people doing that and I understand your fear and I'm hoping that as we go through the book and start digging deeper chapter by chapter that you're going to have a peace of mind that you do feel like you're armed with something far stronger. Let me tell you something. Nature is far stronger than any man-made anything. We just have to realign ourselves with helping nature instead of fighting and fussing with it. The next chapter is on how we can interplant vegetables into our garden um, and we're going to dig deeper on that. So as we wrap this up, um, I just want you to think about the really big picture of everything. This is all, this whole book is about a lifestyle choice and choices that we make and changing our focus. And what you're going to be focusing on or what we want to focus on and what has been my success is first focusing on the ecosystem, on growing flowers, using no pesticides, and then giving nature time. Um, and when you learn to embrace all these things, you're going to be inviting nature in to do all the heavy lifting in your garden. Um, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. And I look forward to meeting you here next week. Same time, same, well, not same place, because we'll probably be in a different place next week, maybe. So, hey, till we meet again, ciao.